All right, you're very welcome along. We're talking hurling, and uh, I'm delighted to say we've got two of the stars of the summer with us. Uh, Park Marty and Anthony Nash. I'm going to show you this because uh, it's a bit of action involving both of you. It's from the All Ireland semi final, and uh, what's about to happen here, Park? It's going to make a good save. <laughs> That's not a good save. It's a great, ah, great save. save. Yeah. Um, so I think I didn't realise I was that far out from the goal. Actually, oh. the head, of course. <laughs> thanks, thanks, thanks. <laughs> nah, it wasn't. In fairness, it was a super save. Yeah. And, um, so you do a better job of talking through your heroic I, save there, Anthony. Ah, oh, jeez, I don't. I actually thought, like, when I hit it, I was going to go away celebrating, thinking that it was very like so. It was a good save there. Yeah. So you, you come straight off the hurl and you're like happy days. I yeah, just got a great goal. Straight, any better. Um, did you? Could you see behind Mark Ellis? No, there, no, you used Ellis. Yeah, a little bit blindside. That's yeah, why I that's what I didn't worry, see. Like. That was it. Like when Mark went to block it, that was the. Yeah, see, you couldn't really see it there. Mm. Uh, no, Jesus. So you yeah. saw it late. Yeah, or look, look again. If good forward this was when they're coming in, if they can use a defender, it's going to hinder the chances of a goalkeeper. Now, look, uh, any goalkeeper said there's nothing going through your head or anything like that. It's not that you're. You know, you don't know what you're thinking about or anything like that. It's just you just throw the hurling far enough. I got around it, but I think if you asked him what happened after that, I think he'd tell you that Waterford won. So it didn't really matter, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> How much of using the bodies is that something you're conscious of when you are even that far out of goals? Um, to be honest with you, I don't get in that close to the goal that often. So um, any trick in the book? It's kind of unknown territory for me. Nearly going in there, but I did. I, I actually, when I did get the ball, I seen Ellis coming towards me, so I was like, right. I can kind of use him as a shield, like for you know. I suppose in the middle of the championship, you're not really kind of thinking too that quick. And just doing like it's just the fact that Mark put himself in that position. Like, yeah, yeah. I looked at him, Paul, he's one of the best strikers of all in the country. Like so, um, like when you see a fellow bearing down and go like that, you're just it's just reaction. So you know he's going for goal, though, even though you can't see it. Like you um, get the sense that. Like, well, you don't. You, you don't really like. It's just honest to God. It's just in the moment, anything can happen. Like um, it was. I don't know, just kind of looking at it again, I haven't really seen it. Like It was just that um, you're always ready for a shot, just in case. But uh, where he's going or anything like that, you can't read. Because, look, into county level, forwards can break their wrists, change body, you know, uh, change the way the ball moves or something like that. So um, you're just hoping, really, more than anything, that it hits, uh, hits off something, blank you. That's a pretty edgy existence then. You're, like, constantly on edge waiting yeah. for somebody to have a shot. Yeah, like, it, look, I, I was even speaking to people earlier there, but like, I was saying that, like, physically, I'm not drained coming out of a game but emotionally you are as a goalkeeper because like, you're just constantly on like look I suppose the old thing of you drop a ball and goals is a goal you drop a ball in midfield you might turn around and pick it up and clear it again or do whatever like so you're kind of just constantly kind of concentrating switched on and just one strike of a ball and it's into you you know even from any defence um, with the way the, with the way the ball travels nowadays so it's just more mentally more than anything you're kind of on edge you know and you're how, do you, how do you actually prepare for that though? Like, that's um, I don't know it's just experience really more than anything just playing games like um I suppose you can't do everything in training, like you know, it's just from playing games, gaining experience. Like, and I suppose the fact that I'm the wrong side of thirty, you know, in a way for a goalkeeper helps because kind of get more calm, kind of just uh, you know, just understanding the game a little bit more. And the fact that I've played a number of games for Cork now at the moment is just you're a little bit more, um, what would you say, easy going into games if you know what I mean. But, uh, like it's looser. Yeah, like I suppose when I first came on the scene, I suppose I was trying to get myself a little bit worked up, pumped up going to a game, and like Patrick Horgan has always slagged me and go, "What are you getting worked up for? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You're a goalkeeper." Like so, I actually try and go in camera into games now and just kind of just you're trying to see what's going on. Like f for a lot of the time when the ball's up the other side of the field, you're trying to you know just encourage your defenders, and by doing that, you're actually keeping yourself in the game. Yeah, you know what I mean. So like even though the players probably give out that I talk too much in the field, it's more for myself as well to keep the kind of switched on. You know? Well, yeah, because that makes sense now the way you're talking about it. If you're very worked up and somebody is bearing down on goal, like you're thinking uh, 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 as yeah. opposed to uh, yeah, look, where's the ball what's the movement yeah look the thing is for a goalkeeper most of the time you have to be actually it's just you might have to control a ball okay you might have to catch a ball and if you're pumped up and jumping around the place or kind of jittery it, it's not going to help your game like you know um, but it's just from being involved with your Cunningham uh, you know for years don't look Cusack Martin Coleman the likes of those fellas that I would have learned all those kind of things that look Try and just you know be steady be calm um, and my goalkeeping coach over the last year we would have worked on different things but it's just trying to do the right things at the right time and if you're not mentally yeah. there then you're not going to do it like you know the extra adrenaline is no good either when you're like trying to no. pinpoint no. accurate pick out somebody from 40 yards as opposed to it probably be the same freeze like you know if your head isn't you know isn't isn't in it like you know you, you, you really have to kind of just be like your head can get in the way sometimes do you know what I mean like so if you're really trying to overthink things um, so it's just being kind of just clear head and being able to do things, you know, um, w w it's definitely a benefit having having a clear head at times, you know. Well, talk to us about the freeze and the adrenaline then. At what point do you have to calm yourself down and try and not be in Crow Park or Simple Stadium and just be in the back garden or whatever it is that you do to get into the moment? 
Yeah, um, I suppose the minute the whistle is blown for a free, um, straight away my process of putting that ball over the bar, obviously main objective starts and so just relaxing a couple of deep breaths and then I start my visualisation straight away. So just for every free I try to do the same routine, the minute I suppose I get that ball in my hand I just you know visualise it's over the bar. Because I think then once you're visualising it's over the bar, how can you kind of you know be nervous or how can you be worried about the outcome when it's over the bar? And I think that's the main um, process for myself. And then obviously just making sure um, my alignment is right. And I'm I'd always try and have my two feet like in line with the left hand post. And then it's just about making sure to lift and then following through on the strike. And um, as you said, you know I'd practice. Uh, two or three times a week, try and just get out, maybe hit 30, 40 frees, whether it's up in Ballygonner or before training in Welsh Park with Waterford. And then just sticking to the process for every single free. And I think if you do miss a free, you know, if your mindset is the same going into the next free, then, you know, you're not worried about the previous free. You're just thinking about this, putting this one over the bar and um, just trusting then your ability. How many frees in a row do you have to get before you can give up? when you're doing the 30 or 40? I'm not really that superstitious in that way, but um, I'd always try and end on a, on a positive note, so maybe the last in couple a row. of frees. Nah, like, just I, I, how I line up my frees, I, I might just pick five spots when I go up to the pitch and throw down 10 slitters at that spot and you know just strike them and make sure you leave that spot on, on, a, on a score and move on to the next spot. And um, One of the best pieces of advice I think I ever got was just... Um, a Bally Gunner man said to me before, he said, when you go out onto the field, like your first free or whether it's your first shot in the warm-up, make sure it's 30 yards out straight in front of the goal because, you know, straight away you're starting off on a good note and um, with, with a score. So that's, yeah. that's the way I follow through with it. The process that you have now, it, it seems like very clearly worked out in your mind. When you broke into the Waterford team, did you have exactly the same process already at that stage or is that, does that come a bit later? Yeah, obviously... Again, as Anthony touched on, with experience, you might tweak one or two things, and obviously, from a mental point of view, you know you you, you develop in terms of like my 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 process. Going into every free, I'd be more confident the more I practice. Obviously, and when I was probably eighteen, nineteen, breaking into the Waterford team, it kind of everyone was happening so fast that I wasn't even thinking about what I was doing. Really, you're kind of just in there. You're you know you're kind of immature, and you're just going with the flow. And obviously, then you realise that you need to tweak one or two things here and there and since then then you know it's just following the routine every single time yeah so at some point along the way you realise actually I'm not a kid anymore I'm not going to be able to rock up hit nine in a row and it's going to be grand mm. you, people are going to start talking to you about it and you'll get worried about it and it, comes, it gets in on yourself a little bit yeah it does and you know it's about being able to distance yourself from the outside maybe perception of you know people in your ear or, you know, listening to the crowd or, as you say, whether it's in Crow Park in an all and final or at home in the back garden hitting the ball against the wall, practicing freeze, you know, it's it's about being in that zone the whole time of, you know, you know what you're doing and just repeating it over and over again. Yeah. Um, from your perspective, just in terms of the accuracy of the puck outs, like, there's a, it's a very high risk thing to try and go relatively short to somebody because if the catcher misses it, then you know somebody's either through on goals or it's a fairly easy scoring opportunity for them. So you've got to practice that level as well as actually the shot stopping. That's the the, the two kind of. Yeah, I'd actually probably concentrate more on striking than with shot stopping. Like if you look at the kind of stats of games, goalkeepers puck it approximately around thirty times a game. You might even get a save in three games in a row. Do you know what I mean? So I just try and concentrate more on the striking. Um, How do you do it? What's the what are the drills for that? Do you know, it's just repetition. It's just repetition, really. Like it's kind of something similar. No, getting to free taking. It's just for me. It's just once I feel the strike is good, even if I miss a target, if the strike was good. Like I play golf as well, so I can actually link the two sports to each other. Um, I can kind of get an understanding of where I maybe missed a strike, or if I overcut it or drew it or something like that. You know, so I just try and get the same. Um, uh, like Paul mentioned a while ago, there it's about pick up and free. It's about throw up and hurling as well. You know, once the throw up is the same, and the strike from the same position all the time. So it's just repetition. Uh, it's just you know what just playing games and training, um, you know, having uh, drills created by the other goalkeepers and our goalkeeping coaches um, to just practice, 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 like, you know, um, yeah. and once your head is in the right place and you're confident enough to go for them, but look, it's a high risk, high reward kind of a thing, if you can get possession in your own midfield, then it's better than, I suppose, a 50-50 ball down the opposite 45, you know. Yeah, completely. What are you playing off uh, in golf? What's Six. It? All right, so you're pretty serious about that as well. Uh, I love golf, yeah, I, I played it since I was very young. Um, 
unfortunately I went from 11 to 6 from last year in 16 so we had a bad hurling year <laughs> <laughs> so when the hurling is good the golf is bad and when the right. vice versa but um, no I love it it gets me away from hurling but even though there is as I said there's an overlap between the two I can kind of correlate my striking in both um, but it just it does get me away from hurling um, I, I play an awful lot with my family like my uncles my father and a few of my friends and it's just get out have a chat um, and yeah. uh, just look as I said it's a kind of a switch off yeah totally what do you do to switch off? Yeah, play a bit of golf as well. Um, Off six I'm not as, as well. good as Anthony here, but <laughs> I actually, I probably, you know, I try and get out maybe two or three times during during the summer, really. But I joined actually back there a couple of years ago, and they gave me a handicap of eleven, and I'm an eighteen handicapper, so I was, I got a bit of a raw deal, and I think it was down to the hurling and that. So, I'm sure, yeah. Um, it kind of knocked me back a bit because you know the conference was gone, but I was shooting twenty four points or whatever, and you know, so. Um, yeah, no, but it's it's good. Uh, as Anthony said, it's, it completely switches the mind off, and you're out there for three or four hours with your friends or whoever, and um, you know, it's certainly a good way and a way I enjoy relaxing. You obviously had a, a really good year this year. Do, does it feel like you had a really good year, or does it feel like you had a, a year that you're still pissed off about? Yeah, not really. I wouldn't say a good year. Like I'd look back on a couple of games and be like, you know, I could have done this better, could have done that better, and. Um, and obviously, you know, from a county perspective, there's no silver on the table. So I think any year we look back and there's nothing on the table to show for it. It's you know you, you have plenty of regrets, and obviously then from a club perspective, we're still going. So and you know any year you win a county which county medal with your club, it's 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 nice. It's and it's uh, you know with your friends and lads who have probably been playing with since I'm five or six years of age, and you know there's a number of us who are you know a really close knit group who have been with each other since that age that are still playing today so it's nice to be able to turn around to them after a final whistle in the county final and you know celebrate it with them yeah sure D- take us back to the, the All-Ireland there was a, a bit of a debate about whether or not Derek was going to stay on obviously he, he's announced recently that he is going to stay on and from the outside it seems like that's very important that you guys are all collectively you've been very unified in the face of some stern criticism some of it from within the county over the last couple of years and you've come through that and frequently it's those teams who've been through that that actually benefit the most from having a tough time. Yeah, look, I suppose... Maybe it doesn't feel yeah. like that when you're in the middle of it. That's the thing, like, I think, you know, everyone's obviously entitled to their opinion, but as a group of players, Anthony will tell you the same about Cork, you're kind of locked away in a bubble, really, and you're just kind of, you're living out of each other's pockets for eight, nine months of the year, and you're not listening to what's going on on the outside, and obviously over the last couple of months, then there was question marks whether Derek was going to stay on or not, and... Obviously, look, we're delighted that he's there for another year and, you know, he's put a massive amount of work and time and effort into it over the last number of years, so it'd be a shame to see that go to waste. And um, so, look, we're obviously looking forward now to 2018 and back with the same management team again and hopefully we can drive on a bit further. It can't be that easy, though, to tune out all the noise of people complaining about the style of play. Like, that must be the one thing that actually does filter through when no matter, like, you're buying a loaf of bread and they're like, Jesus, we don't have to poke it in long. Yeah. Yeah, look, I suppose it's... You know, people are talking about it for so long now, about three or four years, that we don't really care anymore because it's gone so far, you know, overboard. And um, I think a couple of the players would have seen it throughout the year, like, you know, we're the fellas who are going training five or six nights a week in the gym, you know, running hills, whatever is asked for us, we're the fellas doing it. And people probably don't see that from the outside, you know, what goes into actually getting to a, a Sunday of a Munster Championship game or whether it's an all quarter quarterfinal, semi-final or final. You know, there's huge work goes into it and you have to just trust yourself that you're doing the right thing and, and the way you're doing it and that's the way we are in Waterford. Yeah, I wonder what you made of that story. I'm going to obviously ask you about your own season, but like as an outsider from outside Waterford looking at the criticism that this Waterford team were getting, considering the journey that that team has been on, I, like and particularly because Cork Hurling has got this in the last decade and a half where you just completely ripped up the template, did something new, everybody thought this is ridiculous. Oh look, we just won a couple of All-Irelands, what a great idea that was. Mm-hmm. Uh, look, I think probably touching it there, like, look, support is massive, uh, it's great in Cork and everything like that, but, and, and people are entitled to their opinion, but like, you know, I- when it's good, you shouldn't listen to it, and when it's bad, you shouldn't listen to it, do you know what I'm trying to say? Because otherwise, like, you're either one side of it or the other, like, and if you can kind of just stay you know, middle ground or something like that. Um, Look, the good thing about GA in Ireland, it kind of unites communities and people get to speak about it, and that means there's hundreds and thousands of opinions. Um, I'm sure part of the same. Like, once you win, it doesn't matter. I couldn't care if we played 15 fellas behind the ball, if it meant us winning in Ireland, or if it meant we played 15 up the field. Do you know what I mean? I, I don't think the Waterford players would even think that. I think you mentioned the journey there. Dan Shannon actually spoke to us in the dressing room after the Ireland semi-final this year and mentioned the journey that they were on. And, like, Waterford have been, you know... 
uh, unbelievable since Dan Zira and stuff like that, you know, and like the, making another and final this year, like, and look, I hope they don't go a step further next year, obviously, <laughs> like, but, um, but like, you know, you can see from the outside the, the kind of the community that they have and the unity in the panel and stuff and what Derek has brought to it, but uh, I, I'm sure, and like Paul Touchdown there, look, once they go in training, it doesn't matter what way they play hurling, like, it's still hurling, they still pass the ball, they still score goals, they score plenty of scores this year, so look, maybe some of it people might feel that it's it's just I don't think it is I think and they've got some unbelievable hurlers unfortunately we were the wrong side of a, a Waterford you know beating on many an occasion for the last few years but um, every time we go against them I think it's a good game of hurling like you know I think it's a thing like that you can talk sweepers this sweepers that they made another in the final run lucky not to win it so you know I, I don't think any of the players would care you know What about your own season? Very similar very similar like you know I think it didn't look winning Munster is great don't get me wrong and where we were in 16 to win Munster I suppose a lot of people from the outside wouldn't have given us a hope um, I spoke last year and uh, uh, just before we led up to the Wexford game and obviously I was wrong by saying it but I still felt that 16 had a, a chance of doing something special and Wexford put in a good performance and beat us and looked deservedly so um, but I think that from the outside, if you looked in, you said, Jesus, Cork came from nowhere. I don't think we came from nowhere. I think Munster is so competitive that any team can win it. Um, but I think, at, like Paul just touched on there a second ago, yes, we have a Munster title, but when you get to Northern Ireland semi-final, you want to get there. You want yeah. to get to the final. You want to play in the final. So a little bit of bitterness at the end of the year. You know, you'd love to have gotten to the final, um, whether we'd have won it or not. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's Galway were awesome all year, in fairness to them. But uh, you still would have liked to have partaken in the final. Um, so a little bit of... Uh, bad taste at the end of it Munster was great we had consistent league campaign as well which was good but, but the early part of the league campaign there was a couple of mm. defeats I remember mm. looking at Kieran Kingston doing one of the post-match interviews going Jesus the team like they were shook tonight and he looks like he just looks like he doesn't really know exactly why that happened and at mm. that point it would have been easy to write you guys off I'd say everybody did write you off oh they did Usher like we were outsiders uh, in Munster we were the least favourite or the, the lowest favourite whatever um, to win Munster or anything like that but like look d you know there are surprises every year I suppose but the one thing we tried to work on the league this year um, was just getting consistent performances and we lost uh, a couple of games but we, we played well in patches in them and that's what we were trying to work on yeah. so then when we actually came into the championship we were confident with the performances we put in and you know a little bit of form we had going into the to the championship then as well so and I felt we carried that through a little bit It's um, funny to me to listen that you did think last year there was stuff there that you could build on when everybody outside would have said oh Austria, this is a but, low point but like, partially, like, look, Unfortunately like, I haven't a clue what's going on in the Waterford setup. I don't know what's going on in your Tipperary I know what's going on in Cork you know, I know what's going on, on the inside. And unfortunately, when you're not involved in something, like I can't comment on in the Cork footballers because I don't know what they're doing. When you're inside in something, you have a feeling. And like I went down to Park Your Ring, not this year, but the previous year, to see the Cork Twins lose to Limerick. And my cousin was playing for Limerick, so I kind of had a, kind of, you know, I, I had an interest in, in kind of both sides. But I saw five or six players in that 21 team that lost that were going to be big difference. Mark Coleman was one, Shane Kingston. Not bad. Luke Mead. Yeah. Dara Fitzgibbon. Pat Collins, the goalkeeper. Do you know what I mean? You had five or six lads coming through that were going to be on our panel the following year yeah. and broke into the team. So, like, there was positivities there in 16 with that. So we knew come 17 we were going to have a stronger panel. And hopefully, look, like every other team that's going out there now, we're all in bottom, trying to build our way up to win all Ireland again. Um, and hopefully those lads will come back even stronger and fitter. Were you surprised that Karen didn't decide to stay on when it felt like this was a year of it's, huge it's progress? It's full time. I think it's gone full time. I think the whole GA is nearly full time at this stage. Like his players, Paul mentioned there a second ago, you're all five or six nights a week as a player. Yeah. Uh, a manager isn't, even though he's not on the pitch doing, you know, running or gym work himself or something like that, he's on the phone constantly. Kieran is, I know, put in more than enough time. He's self employed. Um, you know, his work was suffering a little bit because of it and made a decision, I'm surely, based on his family's interests and stuff as well. Um, so, uh, I was, I was disappointed, of course, initially, but the one positive that came out of it is that John was there last year, John Myler, and he is going to bring continuity to what we've had. Um, John's a very positive guy. Look, his son David, you know, has, has had a fantastic career, and John has obviously been one of the driving forces there, so he's, he's understanding the knowledge of professional soccer. He's going to hopefully bring, you know, his idea of professionalism to our thing and just hopefully push on. And the fact that he was there last year and had the 21s, who speak very highly of him as well, you know, we're just going to have to try and push on. But look, I, I'd be friends with Kieran as well. Um, I could have would have got a good relationship with Kieran over the years, so it's disappointing to see him leaving. Of course, but uh, look, as I said, we've a positive step forward with John as well. Yeah, and I'm glad from on a personal level that it did end at least with something on the, the table in Definitely. terms of silver. Like, Sixteen was very difficult for him, and he spoke about that himself over the winter, like how difficult it was, you know, because he took like he takes it personally. Yeah, you know, he really did because he put it 
so much time, I'm sure Derek's the same or any inter-county manager the same. They, it's their lives, you know, so he took 16 tough and we all saw that as players and I suppose that's a good sign of a man as well which, you know, affected him so much. Yeah, completely. Probably th during the year, Derek made the decision to step away from teaching as well and it, it got a lot of press because obviously this is an amateur sport but the demands on the managers is something that everybody's saying. There's two, there's two schools of thought. One is like, it should still be a job that you can do while you're also doing your day job and then there's the other one which is well, actually, there's a bunch of managers out there now who are either retired or who are not doing anything other than this, and that's where the game is at. And if we want to be involved, then we kind of have to match that. Yeah. I think it kind of goes back to what one team does compared to another to a degree. Like, you learn from the best at the end of the day, and, you know, I think if one manager sets a precedent by not working or whether he's, you know, maybe he's retired, as you said, you know, others think maybe that's the way to go. And I think with Derek, like, look, Derek's a perfection perfectionist in how he prepares the team and like if you went to Welsh Park we could be training at seven o'clock and Derek could be in Welsh Park at half four whether it's setting up drills or you know having meetings with the county board or whatever it is he you know he he has he's involved in every every decision that's made and as Anthony said you know for ourselves we might go to the gym two or three days a week and we turn up for training three or two or three days a week but for them it's hours and hours on the phone it's organizing it could be organizing challenge matches it could be trying to get raise money yeah. you know there's so many different things that go on behind the scenes that a manager has to do and you know I certainly I'd say Derek was you know was in the middle of all that and um, that was probably the reason behind his decision and uh, you know and if you look at it I know we didn't maybe win the All-Ireland but um, we certainly you know once he was able to concentrate full time on it he, we, we probably reap the, the rewards of it as, as players Yeah one last question on this um, a lot of extra games next year it has to be a good thing right? Yeah I think the timing of the games is good like there was a kind of a study done by the GPA a few years ago and they asked players what do they want and we said more games but I think players want more games during the summer look obviously we all like hurling the dry in you know, good yeah. conditions and stuff like that um, how it's going to affect it I don't know the one fear I had about it all was the attendances you know it's going to be a lot of money for people to travel four or five weeks Yeah. Um, I think the home and away idea would be good like I think we've watered for the way in Walsh Park like, so you can be guaranteed it'll be you know, a full house and if there's something lying riding on the game it's going to be an uh, incredible atmosphere down there um, I think the games themselves look we're, we're either going to be training or playing games Yeah. so you prefer to play games um, it's not a perfect solution to a very old problem, but it's no, it's not like. But it's the only thing is like uh, we were kind of chatting earlier there about it. Like it, it does create problems for the clubs, then I suppose really because you're going to have a in order trying to put April just for clubs only. But like I don't is any intercounty team going to shut down in April and give fellas a month off just to go playing with the club? Like being realistic, like yeah, you know, maybe they will. I, I don't know how it's going to work out, but. Um, Look, it's a very difficult situation to solve. Like, there's no if there was a perfect solution, they'd have it. But you know, um, yeah. but like, I think it's going to take a year or two to implement and see how it goes. You know. Yeah, I like, pretty much on the same wavelength as that. I think you know it is very tough on the club player. I even see it in my own club. You know, if lads going back train in January and they might get a game or two in April and then they're off then till September, as it panned out this year with with, Bally, with Bally Gunner players. So, you know, that is very tough. And Cursing you lads for winning the semi final. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but keeping that hunger going from January right through to September. And, you know, it's a different hunger, games, isn't it? You know, like, it's it totally is, different. It's, it's very tough on the club yeah. player. And obviously for us, it's different because we don't experience that. But just from talking to the lads at home, you know, it is tough. And being able to, it's hard to switch off then completely because you're being told, right, if just say if Watford lose this quarter final, we're playing the following week. That's the biggest problem. And I next think, minute, yeah. they turn around then, Watford win the game. It's put back two weeks. If you win a semi final, it's put back three weeks. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's just, it's it still goes on and on and on. And lads, then where do you peak for? Because, yeah. you know, if the what county season finishes just like that, you have to be ready to be on top of your game in, in a week's time. And, it, you know, it's very tough on the club. That's, there, that's the hardest problem they're going to have to try and solve, I'd say, really, because, like, even for holidays, during the summer, like, fellas are trying to plan their holidays around it. Like, if you were told to, you're guaranteed. I know there's a two week period in July or something like that. or But, like, it's still very difficult that. Like it does depend on the county scene. Like if, like when we lost to Waterford, we were out the following week, or do yeah. you know what I mean. But it, again, it's all ifs, and it, it's not. It's not a criticism of the J. It's a difficult situation. It's a very difficult situation. Look, uh, please God, they'll find a solution to help everybody. Like I know the players, the club players, are setting up their organisation and stuff. But it's it's very difficult to try and you know um, solve both. But uh, look, hopefully, again, look, once promoting hurling well, the championship will hopefully work out. And hopefully people show up to the games as well. Mm -hmm. We've um, got a clip to show you here. You guys are out against the Pierce to get the weekend, having uh, run, been run pretty close by both Six Mile Bridge and Thurlis Arshfields in the last two rounds. No doubt it's going to be pretty close against the Pierce. Shane Dowling is out for that game. Have a look at this. 
So things are going very well for the club at the moment. The Piercing through to the Munster Club hurling final. You're going to take on Bally Gunner on Sunday week. You're injured at the moment. What's the issue? Yeah, a uh, bit more than I than, than I expected. Unfortunately, um, I came off injured in the county final. I uh, wasn't sure what it was. Went for an MRI scan and showed up to the tore cartilage. Uh, no problem with that. Down to to Waterford to get an operation. Uh, Ten minute job. Be out for three weeks. Be back for Munster final. Um, I, 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 if, if that would provide me B Black Rock, I had to hope that we would, and we did. Um, but when he went in through the operation, he found a, a fracture in my knee. There's a big hole inside my knee as well. So he had to do a job on that, which is after setting me back until the new year. Uh, I'd be six weeks in crutches, another month of that to go. It was a holy disaster. And um, I won't be running until the new year. As it turns out, the man that my operation was Tiger Sullivan. Uh, his four sons were involved with Bally Gunner. So whether he was looking further down the road or what, I don't know. Whether it was a hole in me, a hole in me or, or not, I don't know. No, I actually do know because he actually showed me the proof afterwards just in case uh, he, he thought uh, he, he was kidding me. Uh, but it's just, it's just funny how it turned out. We were, we were having sagging before everything for the operation um, about the hurling or whatever because we knew we had a chance of getting there. He knew they had a chance of getting there. As it turned out, that's the case now. So I'm going to blame him one way or the other anyway. Yeah, so all we're hearing is that you were out for three weeks, you'd be back for the final, a bally gunner man ripped open your knee, told you there was a giant hole in it, now you're not going to play again until probably that's February or March. Correct, yes. <laughs> Uh, obviously, Shane Downing's a big loss for the Pearsig. Yeah. Um, you know, he's a top class player. He's proven at inter county and club. Um, he's done a lot, for, obviously, from the Pearsig in the last three times they got to the Munster title. He was a crucial player, so he's going to be a loss. Obviously, we're missing Brian O'Sullivan ourselves, who was after damaging his shoulder. So um, I think it kind of balances out nearly when we were only saying earlier that every game kind of it balances out going into it. and. Uh, the conditions haven't been great in these games. There's still huge scores. You were talking about every, every hurler wants to play, and you just you're looking at the matches, thinking, Jesus, imagine this was high summer, what this game could look like. Yeah, um, they're great games to be a part of. Like you know, I suppose the atmosphere and the buzz is down in Welsh Park over the last couple of weeks, in against Hurlis and against Six Mile Bridge. You know, it's something probably that I'd never experienced as a club player. Yeah. And you know, it's you, you you get it obviously when you're up in Hurlis playing most of the championship or in Crow Park, but. To have that feeling with the club, you know, it's it is a little bit extra special because, as I said, you're playing with lads who, you know, you've been with since you're five or six years of age, and to be on the field and sharing them moments when the final whistle goes, it's it's extra special, and obviously we'd be hoping for the same again this Sunday. What's the story of Cantor? This is um, a pretty amazing winter for you yeah. guys. It's been brilliant. Yeah, like uh, I don't personally play football, but the lads have done um, they did the double this year, which was incredible for us because we're pulling from a small enough pool of players. I think it was something like 12 starting in the football that actually played hurling as well. Is that a philosophical issue you have with the football? Is uh, it no, I'm just trying to prolong my hurling career. <laughs> for us. The old back isn't the same as it used to be. Um, no, I played up until about two years ago. I love right. playing with the lads and stuff like that. Yeah. So, um, you don't hate I the just, game or anything? No, like no, jeez, no, no, no. Uh, well, I won't say. <laughs> no, I don't. Um, <laughs> it's just, I look, I, I didn't have uh, time to commit to it and I don't like being kind of half in, half out. So I kind of half went back two years ago and played and I didn't play well. So um, I was no benefit to the lads. So I kind of decided. But um, for so the club, on it's been unbelievable. Ah, it's, look, it's, it's incredible. Like, because, like, as I said, the fact that we're pulling from, like, w preparations for the county final and hurling, we played Mallow in the county hurling final. Um, and for us non-footballers, we were training. So going into two weeks for the match with four and five of training, that was it. You know, but our coach still came down from from Cork to court to train us. And one of the lads, like that, he isn't playing. He ended up scoring massive scores towards championship. So it's definitely a benefit. But it just shows that pool, the pool of players that we're pulling from isn't massive. And uh, to do what they did is incredible. Um, for us to go senior and hurling though is, you know, it was unheard of really. Like we're the first team of our division to do so. Um, and it's it's just it's an extra special year. You know, we've, Brutally tough game Sunday against Kilmeady. Um, we found out after the county final that if, look, if we were to make a final or whatever like that, that you were probably going to have to play them. Like you know, it was a shock that they got relegated in clear time, so we're going to be under pressure on Sunday. But look, I suppose we're in a position now where you know we're senior in Cork next year, which is brilliant. And like, look, see what Sunday brings in as well. Yeah, so Sunday is a bit of bonus territory. Next season is this kind of journey into the unknown and of excitement. Absolutely. Like I suppose it won't really kick in until the draw is made in Cork. You know, to show that we are a senior hurling team. Um, you know, the club have been working away in the background, now trying to get facilities up and going for even league games and stuff like that because like our problem at home now is that we have four or five lads involved with Cork be it hurling and football so they're going to be missing for a lot of the league games yeah. and stuff like that so we might struggle a little bit in that but in fairness to the rest of the club players they're br it's something that it's a great reward for them to yeah. be doing because as part of like, like I'm gone from I might see Cantor once or twice before we play championship 
you know what I mean? And then I'm back in playing, like, and that's it. And uh, the boys are very, very welcoming when you come back in, like, you get the same slagging as you would all the yeah, time, yeah. like, you know. But uh, no, it's good, and just the year itself has been unbelievable. Um, as I said, like, to do, to do the double was, is incredible. Well, listen, Anthony Pohry, great stuff, lads. Best of luck to you again. Thanks, Thank you.